Well, good morning. Good to see each everyone here this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad to see you with us. And uh, we're happy to have any of those who have found our YouTube channel, Courthouse Church of Christ, and have tuned in on our live stream this morning. We're happy to have you joining with us virtually this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, Out of Bondage. Taking our text from Romans 6, 16 to 23, I want to thank Reuben for reading that for us just a second ago, and we're going to be turning there, but not right away. So if you have already turned there or if you're staying there, place a marker there because we'll come back to it. We're going to actually look at this a little later on. We're going to look at some things first in Genesis and in Exodus. <clears throat> There's an old adage that says, history repeats itself. Uh, that, that's our phrase. Solomon's phrase in Ecclesiastes 1.9, King Solomon once wrote, There's nothing new under the sun. We say history repeats itself. Solomon says nothing new under the sun. It, it, it all comes around. Uh, what, things in the past, uh, we, we see it again in different forms, different fashions. Satan's schemes, the wiles of Satan, Satan the, the sin is still there that has always plagued mankind. It's just been wrapped in different packaging. And history can be seen as cycles where common themes are seen throughout history in different ways. The scriptures are full of stories of people in bondage and then freed from bondage as such an example of cycles. Israel in the Exodus, the Israelites returning home to their homeland from Babylon captivity, the Jews and Gentiles freed from the bondage of sin that we just read from Romans chapter 6. And history is full of people in bondage and the celebration of being freed. Whether we're talking about the captives of Egypt, Syria, Assyria, the captives of Babylon and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans who came after them, all the way to our country. There have been people in bondage and there have been celebrations of people freed from bondage. God wants men to be free. He created mankind with free will thinking so that we can choose and make our own decisions, make our own actions. He wants men to serve him from their hearts. Mark 12, 30, he wants all of us, our whole heart, our whole mind, our soul, and our strength. He sent his son Jesus that he might free mankind from the bondage of sin and that we might be free. God wants his creation to be free. This morning we're going to look at three cycles and see their parallels. We're going to look first at the story of Hagar in Genesis, starting in Genesis 16, if you want to begin turning there. Then we're going to look at that story paralleled in the Exodus and then we're going to find out that the story of Hagar, the story of the Exodus, as Christians, is our story. And we'll end, then we'll end with Romans 6 and verses 16 through 23. And as we look at all of these things, what we want to focus on is that Christians have come out of bondage. And yet so many Christians seek to go back into the world, go back into that bondage of sin. As Christians who have come out of bondage... Don't seek to go back into the world, but keep looking forward. Keep looking forward to that day that Christ has made when he will call us home. Let's turn our attention now to Genesis chapter 16 and begin thinking about the story of Hagar. And the story of Hagar is going to play out in Genesis 16 and Genesis chapter 21. But this kind of sets the stage for her life in Genesis 16, 1 to 6. I'm going to read it out loud, even though it's on the slide for those who are in the back. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Now, let's pause for a moment and think. While she was barren at this time, what was God's promise to Abraham and to Sarah? They would bear a child. And through that child, all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his descendants, right? So Sarai is saying to Abram, basically, God's plan isn't happening fast enough. So she says, please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, 
May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what's good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. The Hagar story prefigures the Exodus, only in reverse. And what I mean by that is, in this case with Hagar, an Egyptian becomes the slave of Abram and Sarah, the Semites, the father and mother of the Israelites. Genesis 6, 1 to 4, you also can see how Paul refers to her as a slave or enslaved in Galatians 4, 24 to 25. Under this house of Abram and Sarah, Hagar is used and mistreated because of envy. Genesis 6, 16, as we just read, 4 through 6, and chapter 21, 8 to 11. But we also see something amazing in chapter 16. We read through verse 6. If you continue reading it, starting in verse 7, all the way through 11, you find that Hagar runs away. She's still pregnant, but she runs away. God sees and hears her oppression. God tells her that he's going to make a great nation out of her son and tells her to go back to Abram and Sarah and submit to her will, Sarah's will. And he promises to make her son into a great nation. He tells her that in Genesis 16, 10 through 14, and also in 21, 17 to 18. But in both of these cases, when she runs away, then later when she and her son are sent out, God says he sees and he hears her and the lad's oppression. And God says, fear not, I will make him into a great nation. Hagar knows she's going to live, no matter how harshly the treatment is. And she also knows her son will live and that her son will become prosperous, that a great nation will come out of him. In fact, in Genesis 17, God promises Abraham that because Ishmael is his son through Hagar the slave, God will grant to him 12 princes. And we'll see that come about later. Later on, as in Genesis 21, Sarai is throwing a party for her son Isaac at, because he has been weaned. And she looks over and there's Ishmael mocking him. Ishmael who is a little bit older. And he's mocking Isaac. She goes to Abraham. She says, send her away. We don't want her in our household anymore. Uh, Abraham is distressed because that is his son. God commands Abraham to let her go in Genesis 21, 11 through 13. God commands to let the slave go. Abraham sends Hagar out with bread and a single water bottle into the desert in Genesis 21, verse 14. Now, Abraham does learn to do better than that. Later on, in Genesis 25, 1 to 6, he will send the sons of Keturah, his second wife, away with very generous gifts. And we're told in 1 Chronicles 1, 32, Keturah is called a concubine, meaning she was, in essence, a slave or lesser wife. And he didn't have to do that, but he gave her sons gifts. And so he learned to do better. And after being freed, Hagar wanders the wilderness and fears that she and her son will die until God provides water from the desert. And it says he had to open her eyes to see the water, so she didn't see a way to survive. And you read that in Genesis 21, 15 and 19. And the bottom line is God takes care of Hagar and Ishmael, her son. In Genesis 17, verse 20, 21, 20 through 21, and 25, 12 to 18, you can read that God indeed fulfilled his promise to Abraham and that from Ishmael came 12 princes, that out of Ishmael was made a great and mighty nation. From Ishmael becomes the nation of that we know as Arabia, that the, the Arabian uh, nomads came from Ishmael. Hagar came out of bondage to freedom, and God cared for her and her son. All of this should sound familiar, because this is what happens in the Exodus to the Israelites. In Exodus 3, 6 to 10, Moses is standing before God in the burning bush. The, the angel of God is speaking to him as God from the burning bush. And he said also I, in uh, Exodus 3 and verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
Now, this is 400 some odd years after the time of Abraham, after those promises. And Moses hides his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. The exodus of Israel from Egypt parallels Hagar's, but on a grander scale. In this case, the sons of Israel, the Semites, become the slaves of the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 1, 8 through 14, we read of a king that rose up in Egypt that didn't know Joseph, and out of fear and envy, he is going to mistreat them, use them, and abuse them because of envy and fear. And you read that in Exodus 1, 9 to 10, Exodus 1, 12, and a great parallel. If you've ever looked for that one passage that could just tell the story of Israel from Egypt to the promised land without going, reading all of Exodus through Deuteronomy, I'm going to give it to you. It's Psalm 105. And Psalm 105, especially in verses 24 to 25 and verse 38, deals with the harsh treatment of Egypt upon the sons of Israel. But you could back up to Psalm 105 and get a great history lesson in a nutshell from the psalmist about Israel's history coming out of the, from the promises made to Abraham, their, their enslavement to Egypt for over 400 years, and then God bringing them out. In fact, it, Psalm 105 even will name the plagues and talk about the devastation that they wrought upon Egypt. But what was amazing to me is reading that as, as we read through Hagar's story in Exodus, or I'm sorry, Genesis 16 and Genesis 21, God sees and hears her oppression. He sees what she's going through when Ishmael is left about a bow shot away because she couldn't stand to see him die. We're told that when the angel of God appears to Hagar, he says, I've heard the lad's cries. He will live and so will you. When God was telling Moses at the burning bush, he says, I have seen the oppression of the Egyptians. Their cries of distress from their taskmasters has reached my ears. What did God just tell Moses? The same thing he told Hagar. I have seen and I have heard their oppression. And so through Moses, he's going to make a delivery because God had promised to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, Genesis 22, 18, and you can read that again in Psalm 105, 8 to 11, where the psalmist recaps that promise to Abraham. God said, I will make your descendants into a great nation. So through Moses, a Levite fulfilling that promise, a Levite was one of the 12 sons, Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, who is later renamed Israel, Moses is a descendant of Levi, he's a Levite. You can read that in Exodus 6, 19 to 20 and verse 26. So through Moses, a Levite, a descendant in the direct line of Abraham, God commands Pharaoh to let Israel go. Moses is to go. Exodus 3.10, Psalm 105, 26 to 36. Moses is to go to Pharaoh and say, Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, the God of heaven, let my people go. Now, it's going to take a harsh lesson before Pharaoh gives the word that says, let them go. And you can read all of that in uh, Exodus, but you can also read it in Psalm uh, 105, 26 through 36, as the psalmist recaps the plagues that were sent and the devastation that it caused on the Egyptians. And the Egyptians eventually do send Israel away with rich gifts. Uh, Genesis 15, 13 to 14, God promised Abraham they're going to be enslaved and then I'm going to release them, and when they leave, they will be given rich gifts on their way out of town. Exodus 3, 19 to 22, God tells Moses it's going to happen again. And Exodus 12, 35 through 36, 
Uh, I love that passage in verse 36. It says, as the Israelites were given the order to leave by Pharaoh, that they asked, they asked their neighbors for silver and gold and rich things. And it says in this way, they plundered the Egyptians. And you can also read in Psalm 105, 37 and 38, where the psalmist recaps the rich gifts the Egyptians sent on their way. It is interesting to note that in Deuteronomy 15, 12 to 15, that giving generous gifts to liberated slaves was later codified into the law of Moses because God reminds them that they were once slaves. So every seventh year when they release their slaves, they are to send them away with very generous gifts. Deuteronomy 15, 12 to 15. But as we continue looking at the parallels between Hagar's story and the Exodus, after being freed from Egypt, the people wandered the wilderness. They feared that they would die. Oh, how many times did they grumble against God? You brought us out here to die. It was so much better in Egypt. I will remind you of Exodus 3, verses 6 to 9, where God says he saw and heard their oppression. Were things hunky-dory in Egypt? No, they were not. They were crying out to God in their distress and suffering. But after being freed, they're wandering the wilderness. This is even before the punishment that they're to wander for 40 years. <clears throat> they feared they would die. God provides water from the desert. You can read that in Exodus 15, 22 to 25. He provides manna in Exodus 16, 1 to 4 and verse 35. And quail, Numbers 11, 4 through 6, 31 to 34. And all of this summarized by the psalmist in Psalm 105 and verse 40. That he provided water, he provided food, bread from heaven, and quail. The bottom line is God took care of Israel. Just as he took care of Hagar and fulfilled his promise that he had made both to her and to Abraham, God here fulfills his promise that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and even to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. God fulfilled all of it. He took care of them and he brought them to the promised land. You can read that as it closes in Psalm 105. 42 to 45, where the psalmist ends by saying, as he recaps this grand history of the promises made to Abraham and the Israelites landing in the land of promise, praise the Lord. That's how the psalmist ends in Psalm 105, 42 to 45. The sons of Israel came out of bondage to freedom and God cared for them and their children, just as he said he would do. Isn't that an amazing eight-point parallel between Hagar's story, only in her case, the Egyptian enslaved by Abram and Sarai, and the Israelites coming out in the Exodus? And an even a more amazing part of all of that is that that's our story. Those same eight bullet points that parallel Hagar and the Exodus are what parallel our story as Christians. So let's read it again, Romans 6, 16 to 23. Again, I thank Reuben for reading that for us this morning and ask you to turn there again as we revisit this passage in Romans 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. And then he tells us an amazing thing in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. We know that. Any student of the Bible knows from Genesis chapter 3 all the way forward, the wages of sin is death. Here he's reminding us of no new truth. But then he tells us, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the world, in that bondage of sin, 
there's death, there's shame, there's grief, there's suffering. But in Jesus Christ, our Lord, there is eternal life. There is freedom from that bondage of sin. So notice these parallels from Hagar and the Exodus. Becoming a Christian parallels the Hagar and the Exodus story, but in a little slightly different order. Unbelievers are sinners, slaves to sin, enslaved by their lusts. We're told this in numerous passages. I just chose a few. Romans 6, 16 to 18 that we just read tells us that we were once slaves to sin before obedience to, to God. Uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 3 and 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19 use the phrase enslaved to your lusts, enslaved to sin. God sent Jesus to deliver mankind from their sins. John 3, 16. Jesus was sent by God to free us from sin. In that sense, God said, let my people go a third time. This from the devil, from sin. So obedience to Jesus will make one free from sin and a slave to righteousness, as we just read in Romans 16, or I'm sorry, Romans 6, 16 through 23. And as slaves to sin, the world is going to love its own, but those who have come out of, the sla of being slaves of sin, those who have become Christians through obedience from a pure heart to Jesus, Jesus says in Luke 6, 22 and Luke 21, 16 to 17, John 15, 18 and John 17, 14, Jesus says on numerous occasions, the world is going to hate you, it's going to abuse you, and it's going to persecute Christians because you've left the world to serve him. And Jesus gives a reminder. He says, when these things happen to you, remember, they hate you because they hated me first. They will abuse and persecute you because they abused and persecuted me first. But there's an interesting thing that we read in Acts 7, 54 to 60. And Paul reminds his audience in 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10. God sees and hears the oppression of his people. He always has. In Acts chapter 7, 54 to 60, is Stephen, one of the deacons, that, one of the, the special servants that was selected in Acts 6. He is arrested, and he's brought before the Sanhedrin. And he goes and gives, that's another place where you can see a wonderful history of the Old Testament unfold. Because he will go all the way back to Abraham, all the way to Jesus. And as he wraps up his sermon and talks about how they killed the prophets... He is dragged outside the city where the people then begin to stone him to death. They do to Stephen what they were unwilling to do to Jesus. To Jesus, they brought him before the governor, the, the Roman governor, Pilate, and they said, he has violated our law. You need to put him to death. With Stephen, they were so enraged, so angry. They dragged him out of the city and they took the wrath of Rome upon themselves by stoning him. They were not allowed to do that under Roman law. But... As Stephen was feeling the effects of the stones falling upon him, he looks up into heaven and we're told he sees Jesus the only time in Scripture that we can read. We read Jesus standing at the right hand of God. All these other passages tell us that he, is sit he sits, he's sitting at the right hand of God. Stephen sees a vision of heaven open and Jesus standing at attention. Jesus saw what was happening. Brethren, when we are suffering, Jesus stands at attention. He sees what we're going through. Jesus sees and hears the oppression of his people. As Stephen saw that, he cried out, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. Echoing Jesus' own words on the cross. God sees and hears the oppression of his people. In fact, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10, the Thessalonian Christians were suffering under severe persecution and Paul gives them comfort saying, God sees it, he hears it, and one day Jesus will return. He will return with his angels in flaming fire to deal out vengeance. And they will pay an eternal penalty of destruction away from the presence of the Lord. God promises through Jesus to accept believers into the family of God and become fellow heirs with Jesus. Well, he promised Hagar, her son, would become a great nation. Well, he promised Moses, or he promised Abraham, and then fulfilled in Moses that, the, his, that Abraham's descendants would be a great nation. Well, God hasn't promised each one of us to be a great nation. What he has promised is that we would be accepted into a family without borders. 
a family without walls, a kingdom without borders, a family the world over, brothers and sisters that we've never met before. And yet we all have a bond of fellowship in Jesus. Romans 8, 14 to 17 says, that bond of family is so strong that Jesus is our brother. And as our brother, we are, as brothers and sisters, his fellow heirs. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18 God says, I will be your God, and you will be sons and daughters to me. And then freed from sin, Jesus gave gifts to saints to get them through life, either until death or when Jesus comes again, as revealed in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, that we might receive the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, and the promised rest. He gave gifts to men, Ephesians 4, 11 and 13, we talked about that last week. And in Revelation 2.10 and Revelation 14.13, we need to remain faithful until death to receive the crown of life. It says, blessed are those in Revelation 14.13, blessed are those who die in the Lord. They will be granted rest from their labors. And while we wander that wilderness of life, God has given us the best gift of heaven. Jesus, as an example and Savior, is the spiritu- and the spiritual tools we need to remain faithful until death. And just when we fear that the world might overcome us and that we might die in it, so to speak, that spiritual death, God reminds us that we are saved. We're not of this world. We can call on him in prayer. We can overcome the world through our faith. In John 17, 13 through 21, 1 Peter 5, 6 to 7, and 1 John 5, 4 through 5. And he tells us an amazing thing. And this harkens back to the parallel with Exodus. In John 4, 13 to 14, and John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of heaven. I am the water of life. If you're hungry and if you're thirsty, eat from me, drink from me, and you'll have everlasting life. Jesus is that manna. He is that quail. He is that everlasting spring of water that sprung up from the desert. Because God promised to take care of his followers. Even if they suffer in this life, Jesus has promised the hope of heaven, the home of God Almighty. In Matthew 6, 25 to 33, John 14, 1 to 6, and again, Revelations 14, 13, and Revelation 21, 3 through 7. Where it says, on that day, when we come into that home of God Almighty, God will wipe away every tear. All the old things, all the old suffering in this life will be done away. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, and no more death. God has promised to take care of his followers of Jesus. The same eight bullet points that parallel Hagar and the Exodus parallel our story. Christians have come out of the bondage of sin to freedom in Jesus God cares for us and has prepared his home for us that we might live with him forever. Because God wants men to be free. He created man with free will thinking. He wants men to serve him freely from their hearts. And he sent his son Jesus to free mankind from the bondage of sin and to set us free. So we have come out of bondage. Let's not keep looking back thinking that what before Christ we had it so good. No, in the world is suffering, sorrow, and death. Ultimately, that second death, that spiritual death. Jesus freed, sin, freed saints from sin to make them his people, a holy nation, a nation to receive his mercy. In 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He's quoting Old Testament things that God said to the nation of Israel, he's applying it to Christians, both Jew and Gentile. And he says, God says you are now a chosen race, Christians, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God has taken Christians, Jew and Gentile, from all backgrounds, all walks of life, and said, you are my sons, you are my daughters, you are my people. Further, in Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 to 16, 
as we read of the, those heroes of faith. It says that they died without receiving the promises. It says all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they'd been thinking of that country from which they went out, whether we're talking about Abraham and the called, Ur of the Chaldees going back to the land of Babylon, or for the nation of Israel wanting to go back to Egypt. He says, indeed, if they'd been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity. Uh, they would have had opportunity, uh, but they, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, but as it is, he has prepared a city for them. I'm not sure why all the typos in there. I apologize. Uh, it says, and indeed, if they'd been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What he's saying is, if they wanted to go back, they would have found opportunity to go back. As Christians coming out of bondage, if we want to go back into the world, we will find opportunity. Oh, if you even think it, Satan's going to put the opportunity before you to go back. We have to resist that temptation and stay on track. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, Jesus once said, once you take hold of the plow, don't look back or you are unfit for the kingdom of God. Unfit for the kingdom of God. He says, don't look back. That was Israel's problem throughout their entire history. Was they kept looking back to Egypt. And what did they do when Babylon finally swept in and took them all away to exile? Those who were left in the land, they said to Jeremiah, tell us a word from God. God said, don't go to Egypt. They said, well, that can't be the answer. They took Jeremiah and Baruch by force and they all went to Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt so bad that when everything came crashing down and God called on them to have a clean slate, to trust in him. They went back to Egypt. God says, don't go back from where you went out. Jesus says, once your hand has hit the plow, once you become a follower of Jesus, don't look back. And Hagar, Israel's exodus, and our story as Christians, one of the wonderful things we can see is that no matter how much time passed, hundreds of years in the case of Israel in the Exodus, thousands of years from Jesus till now, God fulfills his promises. God always fulfills his promises. Brethren, as Christians, we have come out of bondage to sin, to freedom in Jesus Christ. Don't look back. Be fruitful for that kingdom of God. Be fruitful for that kingdom of Christ, for we serve a risen king. He didn't look back. He looked forward. He asked us to look forward and to produce fruit for this kingdom. This morning, if you are not a Christian, you need to become one, to come out of bondage. That is the urgency of the gospel message. Jesus died so you can be free. Come out of that bondage. There's no need for you to dwell in darkness, but to come into that marvelous light. You do that by repenting of your sins. By being baptized into the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of those sins. Having them washed away in his blood. And if you are a Christian in sin, don't wait till it's too late. Don't hesitate to make it right with God. Don't look back. Don't go back in the bondage. Keep pressing forward. Whatever your request might be this morning. The waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf. Knowing that the prayers of the righteous accomplish much. Come forward. Let your request be known now. While together we stand and sing.